and uh, welcome to the second session of uh, questions from the students, uh, which I'll try to answer. So there are two questions this time. Uh, the first is, what are the lessons that humankind should learn from history? I'm interested in, the, in what are the principal lessons that uh, Dr. Harari believes we should learn from our history? What are his recommendations to us and future generations in order to improve as a species? So, this is a very important and common question about the lessons of history. And uh, what we should realize is that history doesn't teach us any clear lessons. People sometimes have this idea that we learn history in order to understand the past mistakes, like we look at the decisions people made or societies made in the past, and there are some bad decisions, and we learn a lesson not to repeat them, and there are good decisions, and we say, yes, we should do it again, and this is the benefit of history. So my view about history is completely different. History doesn't teach us any lessons because it's very, very difficult to, to, to say, okay, we are now in a position similar to what was a hundred years ago or five hundred years ago, so we should do the same thing again, or we should not do the same thing again. There are so many differences between what's happening now and what happened in the First World War, or what happened in the ancient world, that it's almost useless to try and make these kinds of inferences. The real purpose of history is not to learn lessons, but to free ourselves from the grip of the past. What happens is that people, societies, have a very difficult time understanding the present as it really is because the past uh, doesn't allow us to see things clearly. The past kind of holds us at the back of our head and enables us to see only certain things and not other things. We think like we look at the uh, uh, economy and because of the past we can only imagine the economy or understand the economy in a particular way say, the way of the capitalist system. And we think this is natural, this is inevitable, this is the only way to see the world, this has to be, the, the economy has to look like that. Now, it's not natural and it's not inevitable, it's just the outcome of a historical process of all kinds of events happening one after the other until they lead to the present situation. The real purpose of, of studying history is to understand the rather peculiar and sometimes accidental chain of events that caused the world to be as it is now and also that caused us to see the world in a particular way. The chain of events that led to the formation of our ideologies, our religions, our ideas. And when you understand this chain of events, it kind of releases a little the grip of the past. And you understand this is not the only way to, to see the economy. This is not the only way to understand, say, ethics or the legal system or politics. This is just one way which was created in this historical process. And it didn't have to be like that. And it doesn't have to continue like this in the future. And when you understand that, you are able to see many more things, to see the present more clearly, and to have more freedom of action towards the future. And this is uh, the main benefit of studying history. Now, uh, the second question, a bit related to the first, is about laws in history. Uh, it says, in one of the lectures, you mentioned that there, are many, that there aren't many laws in history, uh, but there are some. As an example, you pointed out that things that are luxuries at first eventually become necessities. Could you maybe elaborate more on these laws and perhaps mention some other examples? So, uh, there are very few laws in history, and when I speak about laws in history in the lectures, I don't mean like physical laws, but I mean uh, things that 
uh, you can generalize about history. Most of the time, it is like that. So it, it's a generalization. It's not really a law. When I say that uh, luxuries tend to become necessities, it's not like a fixed law that there is something in chemistry or in mathematics that forces it to be like this. But it's a general uh, phenomenon which we observe many, many times in history. So when now somebody comes up with a new luxury like a cell phone, we can predict that this will also become a necessity as time goes, as time goes by. Uh, another example for this kind of historical law is that almost all cultures, all societies we know about are built on contradictions. For people it's very very difficult for a society to create, to think about a completely harmonious uh, uh, worldview. So whenever you look at a society, it's very good to remember that it's extremely likely that people in this society believe in contradictory ideas. If you try to understand, say, Muslim society, don't look for some basic principles which everybody believes all the time. You should start your investigation of Muslim society expecting that you will find that Muslims believe contradictory things. Yes, they believe this, but they also believe this, and it doesn't go together very well. Now, for philosophers, it, it, it seems like a big problem. How can it be? But as historians, you should understand, yes, this is the way that human societies are built. Humans have this amazing ability to hold contradictions, to believe in contradictory things at the same time, and this is what enables their societies uh, to function. So it's not really a law, it doesn't have to be like this, but it's a generalization that holds true in many cases, so we can regard it as a, as a kind of law. And another thing we should, should realize about these laws is that because they are not really laws like in physics, they can sometimes change. We'll discuss it in one of the last lectures of the course. Uh, for example, in politics, most of history in human politics, there was this kind of law of the jungle that dominated human politics. The law of the jungle of politics says that war is always a possibility. If you look at any two polities, at any two kingdoms or city-states or tribes throughout history, then war between them is always a possibility. If the Kingdom of England and the Kingdom of France are at present in, uh, don't have war, they are at peace in the Middle Ages, you still have to take into account that at any particular moment a war between them might erupt. This was true throughout history, from the first records we have of ancient Mesopotamia and China until the early 20th century, this was always the case, that between any two polities, war was a possibility. But, as we'll discuss in one of the last lectures, this law of the jungle was broken in most of the world in the late 20th and early 21st century today between not all countries, but between most countries in the world, this law of the jungle has been broken. There is no plausible scenario for a war between, say, France and Germany anytime soon. There is no plausible scenario for a real war between, say, Brazil and Argentina, or between even China and Japan anytime soon. So, this generalization that war is always a possibility, which held true for thousands of years, is now no longer true. So, this is uh, the historical laws. They are not really laws, they are basically just generalizations. And even if they were true for thousands of years, they may still change.